if you act guilty, he's going to think something's wrong. But if you just act cool, then he's going to think that like everything is normal. Exactly. So just pop a Zanny and take it easy, baby. Besides, the DEA agent who investigates pharmacies, come on, please. This guy probably accidentally shot his gun and got demoted. Jake, welcome back to a new episode of the Frostburg Film Society podcast. And um, we have a weird one this week, man. This month we're doing all Maryland films. And for our second screening, we have kind of a... I don't know, it was tough, man. It was tough finding a lot of information about it. It was a really, really small film. It didn't do well. It's called Better Living Through Chemistry. The reason I chose it, I had seen it years prior and, you know, I liked it. But uh, aside from being shot all over, all over the state of Maryland, it was written and directed by two guys that are not brothers, which was, you know, I mean, even in modern times, it's still kind of a rare phenomenon to happen in cinema. You've got David Apostolmatier and uh, Jeff Moore. Small independent film. It was um, funded by a company called Occupant, and uh, it had a budget of about five mil and uh it its box office gross was 120,000 <laughs> which probably explains why not a lot of people came out that and also it was mother's day the day prior and um i think everybody was kind of spent with going out in public or just spent lavishing their wives and moms and whatever you know there there are a lot of things about this film to love and there are a lot of things about this film that don't quite work Sam Rockwell really does a fantastic role, and um, my suspicion is that he brought a lot to the character that maybe wasn't there on the page. Rockwell's not really a guy, even when he does a bad film, his performance tends to elevate it in a really cool and interesting way. And this is most certainly a case of that. What's also interesting is on the poster... <laughs> They, uh, they're advertising Ray Liotta and Jane Fonda. Jane Fonda narrates a handful of times throughout the film, and then she appears in one scene, very impressed with a collection of douches being sold at um, the drugstore that the main character owns. And then <laughs> he mentions later that she has what was it, chlamydia, I think. <laughs> Just the whole time I was like, Jesus, poor Jane Fonda. Ray Liotta appears in, what, three scenes, I think? And that's it. And it, it's just very strange. What's really interesting about this is that the lack of information uh, is plentiful. Uh, <laughs> again, it wasn't very successful. It was made by a couple of first-timers. And I think... I don't know. That's the charm about uh, film societies for me is that you know, it's it's really great to kind of see everything that you can. Um, and it's not really about whether you love the film or whether you hate the film. Uh, the way that I kind of put the schedule together is that most of it is incredible stuff and really a lot of it doesn't get the kind of respect or doesn't get the type of uh, deeper consideration that it deserves. And I also wanted to do some stuff for mainstream audiences and sprinkle in hidden gems. Better Living Through Chemistry isn't exactly a hidden gem. Because, um, again, these are first-time writer-directors. This is a team writer-director uh, situation. And, you know, it doesn't really happen ever. It, it's a unicorn situation where first-timers make a masterpiece. Um, when it does happen, it's all anybody ever talks about, but, um, you know, for the most part, I mean, even things that are groundbreaking, right? When you look at, um, El Mariachi from Robert Rodriguez, or you look at Clerks from Kevin Smith, you can use a lot of genius is there, but there are a lot of rough edges, you know, it's a real punk rock kind of affair and, Sometimes the flaws make the film more beautiful or more interesting. Better Living Through Chemistry, I think, is 
is a case where the successes are what makes it interesting and the failures kind of mount up I hate to say taller but most certainly the issues within the structure and the film itself kind of overshadow and glare atop of the things that really work and they had an incredible cast for this film so Michelle Monaghan the first film we screened was Kiss Kiss Bang Bang and she was in that film and did an incredible role you know it, Shane Black so really interesting well written characters and story and structure so it was, it was more like you know she was set up to hit a home run and it was all on her to fail and she did a great job in that film unfortunately with Better Living Through Chemistry it, there aren't a lot of meat and potatoes so to speak for her or really any female role in the entire film she kind of plays this it is sort of flat you know her husband bought a business from her father and he doesn't respect uh varney sam rockwell's character very much neither does she really he goes along with a lot of the things that she wants and is into but um, his own sense of identity isn't really there. And you could kind of feel some of the leanings. It seems like these are guys that watched American Beauty a lot. And they were trying to make, I don't know if they were exactly trying to make their own version, but they kind of were. Just the unfortunate situation is American Beauty is about a guy that lusts after, you know, an 18-year-old girl when he's a middle-aged man going through a crisis. And when he comes to the moment to where he can have her, her innocence is a reflection of his shortcomings in a place that he was back when he met his wife at the time. And so it becomes this very beautiful thing. Uh, they went a little bit into a different direction with uh, Olivia Wilde's character, where... <laughs> You know, she was sort of ready to uh, to bang him the first time they meet, or it sort of alludes that way. Um, she kind of sees him as a sweet guy and kind of views her husband as overbearing, and uh, she has a little stomach for him. Her husband's played by Ray Liotta, um, and he carries on this affair, which sort of awakens something primal via the obligatory kind of sex that he is not used to having and also via the drugs that she encourages him and it's nothing illicit right like we're not talking about party drugs or um what the don't say no era folks refer to as street drugs you know we're talking about uh pharmaceuticals you know, and you can kind of see he's very knowledgeable. Uh, he's a pharmacist, so of course he knows what drugs and cocktails to create to customize experiences, so to speak. But, you know, it, it's interesting that she awakens something that all of a sudden his wife finds desirable. Uh, and he's just over it. <laughs> The thing I really love about this film is that it was uh, given a March release date in 2014. Uh, but it stretches back to 2010, so these guys worked their asses off for four years to put a film together. A little over four years, because this is February 2010, the first uh, reports come out. In 2010, the original lineup was going to be Paul Rudd. Uh, playing the Douglas Farney character. Um, but then September of that same year, so April, it's going to be Paul Rudd. In September of 2010, Jennifer Gardner and Jeremy Renner are cast. Renner is going to play the Varney role, so I guess they got rid of Paul Rudd. And Jennifer Gardner, who I kind of can't really see playing the uh, Elizabeth Roberts, which is the Olivia Wilde character. It just seems so out of left field for her. And also she kind of, a lot of times, takes on roles that are kind of complex and interesting. You know, I don't always like her, the choices 
in roles that she takes, but they're, they're usually more than just service level stuff. And unfortunately the, um, Jennifer Gardner or the, um, Elizabeth Roberts role doesn't really, you know, she's, she likes to take pills and drink and smoke cigarettes and <laughs> have extramarital affairs on her husband. Uh, they play it as this is the only one, the one that she's having with Vardy, but she's a little quick to jump on the gun and I'm not sure. It seems like that would be an interesting avenue to explore that they just didn't. They just stayed with Varney um, and kind of kept all the rest of the characters very flat and very... There's a lot of cliches and stereotypes in terms of, you know, the ball-busting father-in-law and the overbearing wife and the kid going through a rough adolescent period at, I think he was supposed to be 12 or something, but uh, the kid seemed much older to me. February 2011, they uh, they announced Michelle Monaghan. She's part of the cast. And Dame Judy Dench was going to do the narrator, the uh, Jane Fonda role. But then in July, so... Was that five months later? They start negotiating with Sam Rockwell. In August of 2011, Garner is very much pregnant, and she married, was it Affleck at the time? Ben Affleck, I think? I'm not good with celebrity stuff. But uh, she was pregnant, and so she had to bow out, because obviously you can't have a story like this, and the actress is pregnant, and the husband is cheating on her, <laughs> It's just not a very good look. So they hired Olivia Wilde to replace Garner. And Rockwell was on at this time. March of 2012, Ray Liotta signs on to play the uh, Elizabeth Roberts husband's role. And then May 2012, Jane Fonda joins the cast, taking place of... Uh, Judy Dench and uh, does the narrator and the all that stuff so that's sort of the history that's pretty much all that's available out there and anybody going wait a minute asshole, aren't you literally reading from the Wikipedia page yes but <laughs> there weren't a lot of articles uh, written about this film it has never really received a lot of love I like it more than critics and the general audience does. I think on Rotten Tomatoes, the critic score is 22%, and the audience score is, is it 38, maybe? Somewhere in that park, 33? But again, there, there are things that people don't keep in mind. You're dealing with first-time writer-directors, and they're indie, so there isn't like a big company behind them guiding them in the structure and what they're doing and the content, which, make no mistake, any time a filmmaker comes in to, let's say, the studio system in Hollywood, they are groomed very carefully by multiple departments saying, like, this is how we do this and this. There's a really famous uh, Matt Stone and Trey Parker story. Keep in mind, these guys have made several really good films. They did, uh, uh, what was that musical? Cannibal the Musical. Uh, which came out on Troma. It was their first student film. Fantastic. Out the gate. Really great music, as you would expect. What else had they had done? I think, was it South Park had broke, and then they did Orgasmo? I can't remember if it was vice versa, but Orgasmo is a really great, funny uh, film with a lot of heart and soul uh, to it that you wouldn't expect about a film about um, a Mormon porn star. <laughs> But it's great, and it's not as filthy as they have led people to believe that it is. Uh, really solid film, and then they did Basketball, which is really funny, a little bit more mainstream than what audiences would come to know from Matt Stone and Trey Parker. But then they get multiple seasons of South Park under their belt. They go to make the South Park movie in Universal Studios in their, I guess, wisdom, you could say, <laughs> 
sat them down and like you know here's what film structure looks like and this is the format you need to follow for it to be successful and this is what character art and all just all the minutia of screenplay writing and successful filmmaking the basic stuff that most people go to film school to learn and really these guys had more hands-on experience than you know most of the executives and so forth giving them these lectures about all this so uh, but these guys didn't come from the studio system this was an independent operation with a couple guys that wanted to give it a try that didn't really have much of any um, credits under their belt i believe one of them did some behind the scenes work on was it garden state or something but outside of that little bit you know running a production is running a circus uh <laughs> and when you're new to it it's very overwhelming it's very easy to lose sight of each moment you're trying to grab and while you're trying to grab it it it's really hard to even know what those moments are or what that's about so it's very admirable that they went this direction and it's a shame it didn't work out more for them because i guarantee you a thousand percent that if they would have given been given a second bite at the apple these guys would have made a much better film i think and they got an incredible cast and it the cinematography itself is really beautiful. A lot of it is very simplistic and very one-on-one, but great stuff. Uh, and they had a, it's obvious there was a great crew behind them. Um, it's obvious they had good taste in acting. I'm sure their department heads were the best of the best within their price range. $5 million really isn't a lot for a film, but luckily this is a lot of uh, talky head stuff. So... <laughs> It really, really worked out. I would really like to know what their second film would be, and I, I'm i curious to know if they were kind of burnt out after this. I don't know. Again, there's not a lot of interviews. There's not a lot of background information about the film. When you read the reviews, they are brutal. Uh, <laughs> really brutal. But again, Film Society isn't about here's the best stuff you need and should see. It's here is a plethora of things from different genres that are interesting that maybe you won't like this one, but the next one or the one after could become your favorite movie ever. That was sort of my experience with Film Society, and that's the reason I wanted to start this, was that I really kind of believe in that. And Film Societies, I think, maybe not for everybody, but certainly for me it helped dictate my taste and the type of stuff I wanted to make and the type of stuff I wanted to see and a lot of people love Citizen Kane and it's known as the best if not the top two or three greatest films ever made there are some really great shots and beautiful stuff in it but it doesn't I've seen it a few times uh, <laughs> from film schools and film societies and lectures about cinema but it's never clicked with me the way that uh, smaller, independent, more free-spirited, more uh, risk-taking film has. Like in this case, I like this film. Um, I think it's a really interesting film, and it's really admirable what was achieved on a first outing. But again, there were a lot of problems and a lot of aspects to to what they were trying to do that didn't work or ideas they didn't take far enough. It was you get a sense of you know they want to show this guy with this reckless behavior you know having this extramarital affair with this woman but they also wanted to you know they wanted to have their cake and eat it too right um which by the way is a dumb <laughs> if you have cake why don't you eat it uh <laughs> but um you know they they wanted to show this stuff but there were no repercussions there was no larger meaning there was no larger discovery i mean it you know at the end um the varneys end up divorcing and doing their own thing and finding actual happiness elsewhere which i guess was kind of what they were leaning for but there were larger things they could have accomplished and much more powerful hard-hitting relevant ideas 
it's just unfortunate that they didn't have the know-how. Maybe that's not even true. Maybe it just they didn't have the people in their corner or there were ideas they wanted to go to that were shut down because they thought its current presentation would uh, appeal to an audience much better. But, again, for a film that strikes me as borrowing a lot from American Beauty, what is the ending and the crux of American Beauty? is that your protagonist is shot in the head, <laughs> right? He has to die. And that's where his real freedom and his bliss and his actual appreciation of life comes from, is it happens after his death. It happens after all these revelations. It's after he feels like finally it's all the epiphanies and all of the other stuff that leads to greatness. And even American Beauty had... They were going to show the boyfriend girl, you know, his daughter Jane, her boyfriend, the weirdo filming plastic bags, going to court. And they very quickly realized that opening would destroy all of the work that the film put in right from Jump Street. Uh, and the ending would have no surprise. They're on, on trial for fucking murder, right? So, you know, if they just would have had somebody in their ear, right? You look at... Um, the Star Wars movies. This is not a popular opinion, but I kind of think the only really great Star Wars films, uh, I think The Mandalorian did a lot of great stuff for television, but in terms of the films, the original trilogies, only the really great stuff, right? And Jedi arguably is not as good as Empire, and A New Hope really kind of created a wellspring of what this type of sci-fi space opera stuff could be. Why did the future films not work? My theory is that you had people during the first couple Star Wars offering advice and ideas on how to better the film and how to strengthen what they were creating. You know, every actor and crew member, every, people were contributing a ton of ideas to that film despite how they try to paint it. Um, a lot went into it. Uh, by the time you get to the prequel movies, from what was it, the 90s, early 2000s? George Lucas was George Lucas, right? So nobody was offering anything anymore. <laughs> and he was allowed to create exactly what he had in his head, hence Jar Jar Binks. And, you know, he had some cool ideas, and there were some really great scenes and, and sequences, and the CGI technology really ramped that stuff up but without that input without somebody saying well i think that kind of sucks or your idea might be shit uh, you know you don't get greatness you know and then by the time disney buys it and starts cranking one out like um i went opening weekend to see the force awakens which was the jj abrams led first film i was so pissed off <laughs> Uh, it was a great cast. It was really nice seeing a lot of old faces again. I mean, a lot of these actors are kind of like comfort food now, right? Um, and reprising those roles was awesome. The issue with it was it was a new hope. I mean, let's be honest. Like, um, uh, what is her... The female protagonist of the new Star Wars movies. Uh, I can't remember... Her name's escaping me right now. Uh, she is super interesting, and that's a really cool angle to take in terms of, you know, a tough chick that kicks ass. It's going to become the first Jedi in a very long time. But they followed the formula of A New Hope a little too closely. And I know they're going off Joseph Campbell, but you can build off of, I think, the earlier stuff in a really meaningful way that they just failed to do i think and then you know you have one really dominant african-american character in finn um and i know that they built on la later the later films made that character more than what he was in the force awakens but um you know he's just running around terrified screaming through the entire movie and it sucked because <laughs> you look at the last time they had a strong the past two strong african-american characters in star wars is uh, Samuel L. Jackson. Uh, his stuff was incredible. Sam Jackson's great in everything. And uh, Lando Calrissian, that is 
probably the single greatest African-American character in all of science fiction. I'm sure there are people that are going to argue a bunch of other stuff, but uh, Lando kind of really does it for me. You know, he, he betrays the guy that's sort of... Uh, that he feels stole his ship from him and works with the Empire, which kind of makes sense in one way, and then he realizes the levels of evil and all the the negative shit that happens so he joins the rebellion later and you know is just incredible that the uh space fighting sequences that lando's driving the millennium falcon at the end of Je uh, return of the jedi is fantastic but again it's when the criticism goes away when they lose sight of pushing further and they just want to satiate a base I think they lose all potentiality. Um, and I can't help but wonder if maybe some of that was going on in this film. Again, I like the... It's worth watching. If you haven't seen it, you should totally watch it. I know not a lot of people came out to see Better Living Through Chemistry. Uh, but here's the cool thing about it. It was shot in Annapolis, Maryland, Baltimore, East Arundel County, and the Eastern Shores. It also filmed at the Maryland State House. So it's all over the place. It is very reminiscent of Maryland towns and the fictional, I guess, town that it's set in reminds me in a lot of ways of kind of the charm of Frostburg. It's really beautiful and interesting. It's just a shame that, well, it's a bummer that it didn't get a lot of interest ever, but <laughs> um, it's also a bummer that it didn't reach further and these guys didn't get to make more stuff. You know, there's not a super vibrant Maryland film community. I mean, there's, you know, it's it, there's not, it's not zero. I mean, we, we've got John Waters, for God's sake. We've got the Blair Witch stuff. But, you know, it, it would really be nice to see more of this stuff come out. But what are you going to do? I would highly recommend, if you haven't checked this out, you should see it. And keep in mind that these are non-familial uh, writer-directors working together. For their first time, a first debut film, the f you know, the first time any of us do anything is we're not, you know, we're not hitting home runs, man. Uh, <laughs> and um, it, it's really interesting. It's really fun. Sam Rockwell does great. Uh, again, I wish that Olivia Wilde and Michelle Monaghan's characters were given a little bit more juicy roles and a little bit deeper of characters. I wish they relied less on cliches and more on unique, powerful storytelling. But, you know, hey, man, it's their first time out, and they did a great job for the place they were at in their lives. Um, and I really hope that, you know, it's, you're talking 2014, so that's nine years ago. Uh, but I really do hope that somebody gives them another chance to make another one. Or they just say, fuck it, and try to fund their own film independently and do a micro-budget thing. Because I just, I have a feeling they have some things, they have enough things right in the film that justifies a second film. Um, and I can almost guarantee their second film would be much, much better. This is going to be released on... The 22nd, on the 29th, we are screening our final Maryland film for the month. And it, of course, how else do you end a Maryland movie month than with the original Blair Witch Project? This is a film I've seen a ton of times. I watched it recently. I actually sat down and played the video game. Uh, I've seen the remakes and the sequels. Um seen the documentaries about it various ones and it's a really it's interesting as a found footage film everybody gives this credit as being the first one which is far from true i, I believe uh, cannibal holocaust is the actual first one uh, which is very different from this uh, <laughs> but uh, you know it it doesn't show you very much at all but because it's not showing you very much, it's making it more terrifying. And I love that. Um, the make you queasy, shaky cam stuff that they do, you know, became a staple of the genre. And the genre itself kind of became a staple. You look at 
at shit like Cloverfield, you know, the beauty of it is that it inspires people. People look at the genre of the found footage and they think like, I can make one of these movies. Like, <laughs> this will be awesome. The idea of inspiring other people to make their own films, I think is super important. I'm really appreciative that the Blair Witch Project really opened up that can for American audiences. And now we've one of the top grossing franchises of all time is Paranormal Activity. They made a ton of those films. So if you have time on May 29th at 6 p.m., we are going to be screening the Blair Witch Project in Hotel Gunter Speakeasy as always. Before we go, huge, huge thanks to the Carter family for allowing us to screen them here and for the staff at the hotel. Again, it's an MSAC program. It's Maryland, Art, or Maryland State Arts Council. They help with some of the funding and also very, very supportive of these type of programs pushing art education. Uh, I want to thank everybody that comes out to these screenings. Have a good week.